Uh, good morning or afternoon now. It is Tuesday, March 2nd, uh, 2021. Uh, before we get too far into anything, I wanted to uh, mention, I'm guessing not too, too many people uh, since it's just the beginning of March have looked that far in advance, but I happen to be looking at the schedule and realized that uh, as I was bringing the schedule over from last semester, uh, there were some errors in the way that it input. And so the dates for our final exam and uh, the last lab and lecture exam were off. Uh, so I, again, I fixed it on the schedule, I fixed it on the syllabus, uh, but I wanted to at least make you aware of the fact that there was the change. Just on the off chance somebody had uh, been looking at their summer plans already or trying to schedule something, uh, I wanted you to be aware of that change so you have the correct dates. So the correct dates for the lab and lecture exam five are going to be Tuesday, May 11th, and the final exam uh, is going to be on Tuesday, May 18th. Uh, so those are going to be the, those are the correct dates. They've been corrected on the schedule. They've been corrected on the syllabus. So uh, again, I just want to make sure you had that information so that you're aware. Excellent. So yeah, I thought there might be some people who might be planning. And again, it wasn't my intention. Unfortunately, it was uh, uh, it was input incorrectly as I was bringing it over. I should have caught it, but I didn't. But I caught it now at least. So excellent. You have that information. All right. Let's get to the important stuff now. Uh, we are going to continue exactly what we did in the last class and what we're going to do uh, for all of this week uh, and the beginning of next. Uh, in lecture, we're going to talk bone physiology and the processes that we are responsible for. Uh, and then in uh, lab, we're going to be doing our group stuff. So we're going to do the presentations for the rest of the axial bones that you guys are going to be presenting. So all the groups that didn't present uh, last week are going to present today. And then after that, I will then open up, I've got a, another handout that shows the appendicular bones uh, that you're in bone features you'll be responsible for. And uh, we'll set up those groups again and you'll have the opportunity, same as the last time, uh, to be able to prepare a presentation for that. And that will start on Thursday and then we'll finish that on Tuesday next week. Speaking of Thursday and Tuesday, we have some more assignments due. Uh, unit eight review is due Thursday uh, the 4th. The unit nine review is due Tuesday the 9th. And also on Tuesday the 9th, your 30 point skeletal review is due. And remember that is graded for correctness. It's gonna be using all of your bones and bone features to put uh, the skeleton together. So learning the bones and bone features is an important part of, uh, of that. Um, uh, then on Thursday the 11th, we have our lab and lecture exam, same as the last two. Um, well, maybe today might help with something like that. We'll see how today's, uh, how today's group presentations go and maybe we'll find that uh, giraffe bone you've been looking for. And then uh, uh, because we have a Thursday exam and five days off uh, to get you started on the muscular system, uh, which has just as much anatomy and even more physiology, I've got your two pre-labs, uh, unit 10 and unit 11 pre-labs, again, not the reviews, but pre-labs that will be due on that Tuesday when we come back to class. All righty, so that is the game plan. Any questions on that? All righty then, let's go ahead and get started. Get the lecture, which is here, and we are here. Perfect. So, as I mentioned, we've been working our way through the homeostatic process involving our bones. We learned the two ways that we make bones, normal bone develops. Uh, and what were those two methods again? Now you've had a whole weekend to forget it, but what were the two ways we made bones? Intramembranous. Intramembranous ossification and? Endo endochondrial. Endochondrial ossification, excellent. All right, well today uh, we are gonna learn how to grow bones, because as we talked about last time, nobody here is the same size as they were when they were born. Uh, so we have to go from those little tiny baby bones to big bones. And so we're going to learn two ways to grow bones, grow them in length and grow them in width. So we'll talk about that. Of course, as I mentioned, most of us have probably reached the age or are close to reaching the age where our bones don't get longer and wider anymore, but we still need to be able to maintain the bones. So we'll talk about the three main factors that are necessary to be able to maintain our bones. 
And then probably uh, that'll be all we'll get to probably today. So next week we will talk about, or Thursday, I guess, we'll talk about how we can damage a bone and then most importantly, repair from that as well. And again, like we talked about, we can't talk about the bones without talking about calcium homeostasis. And this calcium homeostasis will really go hand in hand when we're talking about how the bones are maintained. Because while it's important to maintain big, strong, healthy bones, if it becomes a, 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 a choice between big, strong, healthy bones and the right amount of calcium in the blood, as we talked about last time, calcium is gonna win every time. Yep, when we talk about maintenance, we'll talk about exactly, that's one of the major factors we'll talk about why women uh, to get osteoporosis much more commonly than men do. Absolutely, that goes right along with this discussion of calcium as well. Alrighty, so that is the game plan that we know. Let's talk first about our growth of bones in length. Again, I'm not aware of a correlation between alcohol consumption and osteoporosis. So I, I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. I'm just saying that I'm not aware of there being a correlation between that. Um, my guess is that maybe alcohol has a toxic effect on the osteoblast would be my guess, but I'm, I'm not familiar with that. It's interesting. Maybe I'll look it up during the first break, see if we can find it. All right. We're gonna talk first about the growth of bones in length. And as we talked about last time, uh, that growth in length occurs at the epiphyseal plates. And what type of tissue is that epiphyseal plate comprised of again? Hyaline cartilage. Excellent, hyaline cartilage. Oops. Excellent, and that doesn't need to be that big. Hyaline cartilage. So that hyaline cartilage within the metaphysis of the bone is where the bone grows in length. As we also talked about last time, uh, bones don't grow in length forever. Typically around age 18 to 24, that epiphyseal plate uh, fuses up, becomes a thin line of compact bone that we call the epiphyseal line. at which point your bones are as long as they are going to get. Uh, the epiphyseal plate consists of five different zones. So again, if you think of that model we've drawn of the bone in that tiny little metaphysis with that tiny little strip of uh, cartilage is actually consisting of five distinct zones. So let's actually do that. Let's actually take a look at this. Um, and I wanna use the whiteboard for this first because it always amuses me to do so. So we're gonna look at a incredibly denoized version of a long bone where we have the epiphysis up here at the top and then the diaphysis down here. And obviously not drawn to scale at all is the epiphyseal plate. So this whole thing here is that growth plate, that epiphyseal plate. Oops. Uh, and we're gonna focus on the five zones that are found in it. So again, this is obviously not drawn to scale, but I just, I wanna have this exaggeration so we can talk about it. Now, the first zone is actually what is referred to as the resting zone. And what active role in the growth of the bone in length do you think takes place in the resting zone? Yeah, exactly, none. Exactly, this resting zone, as the name would indicate, isn't dead. It's just a chunk of hyaline cartilage that is not active in the growth process. It's, so it's the part of the hyaline cartilage attached. And let me make this smaller. To the epiphysis. Uh, that is not active in the growth process. If it's not active in the growth process, then what do you think it does do? What is its function? It 
does it help when um when like you're done growing or does that have nothing to do with it no again it doesn't it have any function in any kind of growth either the initiation of it or the ending of it really does, does it cushion and provide like is this inside or outside Remember, this is on the outside, or it's, I'm sorry, remember this is on the inside. If we were to draw an actual bone, and let's cheat and draw a tiny bone up here, a little Dino bone. Remember in this Dino bone, the metathesis is basically this little area right in here. So what we've done is we've taken this area here and enlarged it dramatically. So basically it's not the outer surface. So it's not necessarily cushioning, not so much protection, although you guys are getting closer with that. Basically it's, a, it's attachment. It's, it's function is basically to act as an anchor, right? It anchors the epiphysis in place. So it's just gonna act as a, as a uh, no, I wouldn't say that it is more dense necessarily. Uh, it might have more matrix than the other and it will eventually ossify. This area will ossify. So the whole thing is going to ossify. Uh, so, but in this case, it's pretty much just the anchor to help to stabilize uh, the epiphysis and help to keep the epiphysis in place. Someone said so? But did I answer your question? Is that what happened? Yes, yes, you did. Okay. okay, thank you. And uh, just to clarify what I said, Yulia, the entire epiphyseal plate ossifies, not just this resting zone, but the entire epiphyseal plate is going to ossify, become a thin line of um, compact bone. All right, so this is the resting zone. The next zone is the zone known as the proliferating zone. What does it mean to proliferate? Make life. True, uh, life would be, make life would be a good way of describing it or really just make more of. You've got the right idea. To proliferate means to make more of. And that's exactly what happens in this area. This region, this proliferating zone is going to be the region where we have very active rapid dividing. Of the chondrocytes. So there are many chondrocytes in here dividing inside of the matrix. What kind of growth did we say that was? Where the chondrocytes divide within the lacuna and push away from each other? If only we had learned the two methods by which tissues enlarge themselves. One, encourage. Um, interstitial growth? There you go, exactly. This is where the interstitial growth occurs. These cells divide so rapidly and push away from themselves. Basically, they start to look like stacks of coins. Because what happens, and I won't bother drawing the lacunas, I'll draw a couple lacunas. So this cell divides and produces another cell. And again, they make matrix and they surround themselves with matrix and they push away from each other. So notice this is the area where we actually get the expansion of the tissue. Because then these, these chondrocytes divide again, and they divide again, and they divide again, and they divide again, and they're all pushing away from each other. So what ends up happening in this region is you have a lot of chondrocytes that are rapidly dividing and pushing away from each other. And as they push away from each other, we expand the tissue in here and the epiphysis moves farther away from the diaphysis. And so notice right here in our first active region, this is actually where the bone gets longer. Um, this is kind of 
Uh, super easy question, but what do, what exactly does interstitial mean? Interstitial means within the tissue. Okay, thanks. Yep. So this is growth that is occurring within the tissue. And there you go, mission accomplished. Our job was to make the bone longer, and now we have. So of course we're done and we can go take our first break. Except for one issue. If you think about it, our uh, mature bones aren't a tiny little piece of bone at the center that is then followed by a massive region of hyaline cartilage. Is that what our uh, mature long bones look like? No. No. Notice, yes, we've made the bone longer, but we've made the bone longer with hyaline cartilage. And so while that's all fine and dandy, we want the bone to be bone. And we need to convert the bone, I mean the cartilage into bone. But luckily, as we know, life is lazy. And haven't we already learned a way to convert cartilage into bone? This is the part where you emphatically say yes. Yes, yes absolutely, excellent. And that is exactly what happens, right? What were the steps that had to occur for us to be able to convert cartilage into bone? Think back to endochondrial ossification, right? So first, it has to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just gonna say blood vessels, that's it. Okay, true, the blood vessel has to grow in, but remember on the inside of the bone, the blood vessel needed a space to grow into. How did we get that space? Space, there you go, exactly. The first thing that happens is our chondrocytes have to enlarge. And that is what happens in our next zone. Our next zone is called the hypertrophic zone. Again, fun with vocabulary. Hyper, what does hyper mean? Over. Over or increased, exactly. Does anybody know what trophic refers to? Uh, like decay? Yeah, growth, there you go, exactly. Not decay, the, the growth, absolutely. Sorry, I was thinking atrophy. Yep, no, it, uh, perfect, yep, but no. Let me sneak, I'm gonna cheat and move this down. Um, give myself a little more room. Yep, so you had the right idea. Atrophy is a decrease in growth, right? Hypertrophy is an increase in growth. So you absolutely had the right idea. In this hypertrophic zone, just like we knew was gonna happen before, we get, rather than dividing the chondrocytes in this region, increase in size. And of course, the problem with these chondrocytes getting bigger is as the chondrocytes get bigger, the matrix that surrounds them thins and hardens because their lacunas have to get bigger. And as their lacunas get bigger, the matrix thins and hardens. I'm sorry, why, why does the matrix harden? Uh, as it thins, there's less moisture in it. There's less space for moisture in it. There's less space for water in it. And so it starts to dry out a little bit, right? It's like if you took a sponge and you squeeze that sponge, you squeeze the water out of it. And if there's less water, then there's, the, the, you remember, uh, the exchange of nutrients, the exchange of oxygen, the exchange of carbon dioxide, all of that exchange of material happens through the fluid, the interstitial fluid of a tissue. So if you squeeze water out of that area, it makes it harder for the cells to get oxygen and nutrients. And as we know, when those um, cells that matrix gets hard and the cells get really big, what ends up happening to them? They die. Exactly. The cells are gonna die, exactly. So what ends up happening is that the cells die 
chondrocytes die. Again, we should always be more specific and leave a cavity. And notice I didn't pick red by accident because now, as you guys already pointed out, when that cavity forms, blood vessels can grow into the cavity and bring new cells, new chemical signals. So we'll just generalize that to resources. Bring new resources, excellent. And this region is what we call the calcification zone. So in this calcification zone, I'm gonna cheat and draw it in, actually, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'll draw it in pink. So we basically have this cavity space here and then our blood vessels grow into this area. And as the blood vessels grow into this area, then what's gonna end up happening is that we start to form the ossification zone. And in this ossification zone is where osteoblasts and osteoclasts remove the calcified matrix and make bone. And so in this area, we get the formation of new bone that is going to form. And those are our five regions. Now, again, with my tremendous artistic skills, you can truly visualize this and it has been burned in your memory forever. However, we actually have a nice a uh, light microscopy view where he, you can actually see under the microscope what this actually looks like. Notice again up here at the top. I'll use black. We have this thin region that is the resting zone. And again, the resting zone isn't dead tissue. It's just hyaline cartilage that is not active in the growth process. Right, basically its job is to just hold the bone of the epiphysis in place. That's still one of the five zones, right? It is one of the five zones of the epiphyseal plate, but it doesn't play a role in the growth process. But yes, absolutely, it is one of the five zones of the epiphyseal plate. So if, for instance, I asked you the essay question, identify the zones of the epiphyseal plate, you would definitely need to mention it. However, if I asked you to describe the process by which a bone grows in length, you wouldn't necessarily need to mention it. It's a great question. All right, notice the next region, which happens to be the largest region, not surprisingly, is the proliferating zone. Notice in this proliferating zone, as we talked about, you can see all the stacks of chondrocytes as they are rapidly dividing and pushing away from each other. So it is this area where the tissue is expanding. It is this area where we're using that appositional growth, pardon me, interstitial growth to increase the length of the bone, to move the epiphysis further away from the diaphysis. However, as the cells move further away from the proliferating zone, then you can see the cells start to enlarge. And as the cells start to enlarge, the lacunas start to enlarge. And notice there is less matrix in this region. This region is what we call our hypertrophic zone, where the chondrocytes enlarge, the matrix thins, and ultimately that thin hardened matrix leads to the death of the chondrocytes. Notice 
here in this region, there is no more chondrocytes present. We just have that calcified matrix where the blood vessels are growing in. And as the blood vessels are growing in, they then bring the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts that are going to break it all down to make new bone. All right. Could you go back to your previous slide just for like a second? That one? Um, no, like the one that before the pictures. The one I, the, my drawing, is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a slide. I drew that. I know it looks professionally made, but it real oops, wrong button. I know it looks professionally made, but it actually was just me that drew this. So this isn't an actual slide that you can, or a picture that you can buy at the store. This is actually just my representation of it. I know it's shocking. If you want to print these out and bring them to, to school, I'll actually be there one day to sign them for you. Hang them on your wall. Well, the, the, uh, mine's simple. So that's the nice thing about it. And that's one of the reasons I, I encourage you, I give you those handouts to draw your histology. Because when you draw this stuff for yourself, even if it looks very basic and very simple, it allows you to highlight the important things that are happening in each of those areas. And that's really the key to this, right? We don't need to know exactly how it looks like. Well, we do for the exam, obviously, but, but we need to understand this process. And so sometimes the simplest illustrations allow us to do that. <laughs> no, I'm not that cruel. I'm not that cruel or I would use my pictures for the exam. All righty. So to summarize, what happens is within the bone, there is a layer that has chondrocytes because it's a different tissue. It's not actually bone tissue. Correct. It's cartilage tissue that eventually becomes bone tissue. So yes, let's talk about that. So here, and actually, let me get rid of the pictures altogether so you can see me and we can talk about this. You mean in the actual histology, uh, you don't have to, you're not gonna, again, I'm not holding you to that level of histological understanding. Um, the, the short answer to your question, and again, you're not, wouldn't have to do, identify this on the exam, but this, you can actually tell these are the blood vessels because you can see the simple squamous epithelial tissue that are forming them. Uh, but you can see there are still some lacunas in this area of transition, whereas by the time you get to the ossification, although there's still a little bit down here as well. So yeah, this division is probably the, the histologically the hardest to distinguish, but it, cause it's not a straight line, but again, that we're, you're not gonna be responsible for it that way. You'd need to be able to describe it, but I, I probably wouldn't point at a picture of this and ask you to identify the region. So quick question. Yes. Lacuna is used for any cell living in a cavity. So whether it's chondrocyte or osteoblast or osteocyte, they're, either one is in lacuna, right? Well, so hold on, let's go back. Uh, you have the right idea, mature cells in a solid matrix. So bone tissue has a solid matrix and cartilage has a solid matrix. So when a, a mature cell is living inside of that solid matrix, it needs a space, it needs a cave, right? If the bear is gonna live in a mountain, it has to have a cave. And the same thing is true for these cells. If they're gonna live in that solid matrix, they have to have that space and that space is the lacuna. So yes, that generic term lacuna is the, the term we use for a space inside of a solid matrix. So if it's cartilage, then it would be a chondrocyte, the mature cell. If it was bone, it would be an osteocyte, right? Not the mature cells. The mature cells don't live in lacunas. I mean, yeah, the immature cells don't live in lacunas. The blasts don't live in lacunas. Only the mature cells, the sites do. Okay, thanks, that really helped. So let's get back to the other thing that you were talking about. So if you think about it, we have this, and again, I'm exaggerating the size of it. We have this epiphyseal plate inside of our bone in the metaphysis. And as we know, we are making new cartilage and that's what expands it and makes it larger, but then we're converting some of that cartilage into bone. And then we make more cartilage and we convert some of it into bone. And we make more cartilage and we convert it into bone. And we make more cartilage and we convert it into bone. 
in that fashion, my bone is getting longer. But notice as I was doing that, basically make cartilage, make bone, make cartilage, make bone, make cartilage, make bone. My epiphyseal plate is staying the same size. So if my epiphyseal plate is staying the same size, why don't my bones grow in length forever? What happens? What changes that? Isn't it hormonally determined? Absolutely. It is absolutely hormonally determined. And those hormones come on at what point? My favorite age, 13 to 15. There you go. Puberty. Absolutely. You have the right idea. On the onset of puberty, males and females produce larger amounts of our sex hormones. Those are the androgens in males, primarily testosterone. Those are the estrogens in females, primarily estradiol. They do two things. They stimulate the osteoblasts. So we make more bone. So this is when we start getting our growth spurts. We're making more bones. Our bones are getting longer. Our bones are getting stronger. But what starts to happen is we increase the rate at which we're making bone. So now, like before, we make a little bit of cartilage and we make a whole lot of bone and make a little bit of cartilage and we make a whole lot of bone and we make a little bit of cartilage and we make a whole lot of bone and we make a little cartilage and we make a whole lot of bone until we ossify all of that cartilage. When we ossify all of that cartilage, our growth plate has closed and now we have that thin line of compact bone that is the epiphyseal line. So that growth spurt is caused by those sex hormones, but those sex hormones are also what lead to the closing of that epiphyseal plate. All um, right. I missed it. So it actually closes and yep. permanently. Permanently, at which point you never get any taller. All right. Now, I have one more question for you. As we talked about, and I'll cheat and let's go back to the lecture. Uh, here, we'll stick it here. As I mentioned, actually, my handout, my, my picture might have more room. I have more room here. Yeah, we'll sneak it in here. All right. So as I mentioned, both estrogens and androgens uh, stimulate osteocytes, the osteoblasts, to make more matrix. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Well, that's a great question, and I can, I'll answer that in a second. Let's go through this point first, though. I mean, it's a great question, but let's go through this point first. So both estrogen and androgen stimulate the osteoblasts so that we make more matrix. Do both estrogens and androgens influence, um, do both estrogens and androgens influence osteoblasts equally? Or does one affect it more than the other? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? Yes, no. <laughs> well, if they if they both affect it equally, would I be making a point of emphasizing that? No. 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 So do they affect them both equally? No. 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 Which one affects the osteoblasts more? The androgens. Okay. I've heard androgens. I've heard estrogens. Which is it? Estrogens. Androgens. Excellent. I love that, <laughs> that we've got a mixed group. That's spectacular. Well, let's think about this. Across the surface of the globe, whose growth plates tend to be stimulated by their hormones more rapidly so that their growth plates close earlier and across the population are typically shorter in size? Females. Females, yeah. absolutely. So it is actually estrogens that have the stronger effect. on osteoblasts, All right? I have a, um, a really quick question. Yes. Um, so for 
So like how you how you were saying, um, I believe you said your um, brother in law, he grew. Does he have did he or what is that or I guess how to say it? Did he have more um, or did the hormone affect the osteoblast more because he um, like for like tall people, for example, does it affect them more? Does do their hormones are what? So great question. There, the, the cause for that could be many fold. Uh, and again, it, it, all of these things are primarily genetically determined, right? Height tends to be something that's fairly genetically determined. Some of it could be the amount of the hormones that they're making. Some could be the sensitivity of their cells. So some cells are going to be more sensitive to others. And some could just be morphological. If someone has a thicker growth plate, it's going to take longer for it to close than someone that has a small growth plate, right? That's actually, there's actually a form of dwarfism where what happens is the individuals are born with very small growth plates. And so as a result of that, their bones, their, their epiphyseal plates ossify prematurely and their, their growth is stunted as a result of that. So there's lots of factors that could influence it, but so those are some examples. And, and most of those are genetically, many of those are genetically determined. Okay, thank you. Now, let's get back to this for one other thing. So we know that estrogens affect the osteoblast stronger than androgens. And of course, the other thing we know is that at puberty, both males and females produce high levels of estrogens and androgens. And as we also know, those levels of estrogens and androgens stay high for their entire lives all the way till death, right? No. No. What do you mean no? Definitely not. Why do you say definitely not? Because our hormones fluctuate, especially for women, their hormones fluctuate a lot during their life and they complain about it. So we know they fluctuate. Well, okay, so I, I will give you that, that, um, but I will tell you both males and females hormones fluctuate during the course. Uh, males have a hormone cycle and females have a hormone cycle, but you're right. Females hormone cycles are typically larger uh, than the males. I will give you that, but ah, there you go. Amanda hit on what I was actually getting at. And that thing that I was getting at is while, even when the females are fluctuating, they're staying relatively high until something magical happens. And that magical thing that happens is menopause. During menopause, the levels of estrogens in a female drop, right? So let's talk about grandma. Grandma can drink a whole cow's worth of milk, but if she doesn't have those estrogens stimulating the osteoblasts, she's gonna have a hard time taking the calcium from that cow's worth of milk and depositing it into her bones. So grandma, as opposed to grandpa, has a harder time maintaining big, strong, healthy bones after she reaches menopause, which as someone asked earlier, is why females are much more commonly uh, get osteoporosis than males do. Uh -huh. That osteoporosis is due to the drop of estrogens and now suddenly uh, it's going. not able to stimulate those osteoblasts sufficiently. So how do we prevent it? How do we not lose our bone density? Well, so uh, there's no way to not lose any of it. Right. Uh, so, uh, but the two things that can be important are obviously to get a lot of calcium in your diet, make as big and strong bones as you can when you are younger so that you're better able to withstand it. Uh, and in extreme cases, uh, there are hormone therapies that people, that women can have to help to stimulate those osteoblasts to help to maintain it. So hormone th therapy is an option. Um, exercise can be an option, absolutely, things like that. And we'll talk about the things that can be done to maintain it. So nutrition, exercise, hormones, all of those are things that can help. But unfortunately, some of it is also genetically determined. If you, if you have fewer osteoblasts, then all the exercise, all the calcium, all the hormones, are still not necessarily gonna help you to sustain that bone. They'll help, definitely better to do those things than not to do those things, but it isn't something that can necessarily be staved off entirely. 
All right. Now I want to get to one other question that was asked. I think I got all of them, but the other one that I remember someone asked, and if someone asked a question I didn't get to, uh, the other thing that was asked about how, why we get shorter with age, because again, if your grandmother's anything like mine, she's about half the size that she was when she was uh, younger. Okay. Not exactly. Uh, and yeah, Cody's pretty much got it. It's gravity and not so much the bones, but it's really the connective tissue in between them. Uh, the, uh, the fibrocartilage of the intervertebral uh, discs, uh, the uh, fibrocartilage of the meniscus of the knees, things along those lines. So it's primarily spinal compression. And again, it happens to everybody. Everybody during the course of a day can lose as much as a quarter of an inch in height. You are actually about a quarter of an inch shorter at the most, you know, some maybe closer to an eighth, one eighth to a quarter of an inch shorter at the end of the day than you are at the beginning of the day. So if you're, you know, self-conscious about your height, uh, then uh, don't jump on air. Oh, jump, jump from airplanes. I thought you were, don't jump on the airplane. Um, if you're self-conscious about your height, always measure yourself first thing in the morning when you wake up after you've been laying down and, uh, yeah, the, the, the weight, the gravity absolutely can help to pull you down. Uh, some of it for males can be hormonal or like I said, it could be genetic problems or numbers with their osteoblasts or things along those lines. Yep. Excellent. So I think that was all the questions and I think that was everything that I wanted to answer about this. So any questions? Any questions on our growth in length, the epiphyseal plate and our growth in length? So any other questions okay, on that? Is this mainly how long bones grow and not the other ones, or is this how all of them grow? Uh, these are how, uh, again, all of our bones get bigger. And, and again, remember in this class, the sky is blue. So we are painting with some big strokes here. Other bones get bigger and obviously uh, flat bones and irregular bones are gonna get bigger in slightly different ways, but we are focusing on the long bones when we talk about the growth, about growth in length. We're also gonna focus on the, bone, on the long bones when we talk about growth in width as well. But yes, all of them are gonna use similar methods. Some of them may be a little simpler, some will be a little bit more complicated, but they will all be similar. Okay. All righty, excellent. I think I saved that, but it's this, but I'll save it one more time just to make sure. I did. So what we need to talk about next is we need to talk about growth in width. As we talked about originally, growth in width occurs via appositional growth. Someone again, remind me what appositional growth is. Occurs outside of the tissue. Okay, on the outside of the tissue, absolutely. Under the perichondrium. There you go, perfect, excellent. The appositional growth under the perichondrium. Excellent. So let's say for instance, here we have a long bone and we'll take a cross section through a long bone. We know that long bone around the outside has that perichondrium and under that perichondrium, it houses those mesenchymal cells. And as we know, that mesenchymal cell divides to become an osteogenic cell. That osteogenic cell divides to become an osteoblast. And that osteoblast covers itself with matrix, right? So we'll, we'll do a second drawing here where we talk about and emphasize that we get the formation of an osteoblast, right? The mesenchymal cell becomes an osteogenic cell. The osteogenic cell becomes an osteoblast. And as we talked about, that osteoblast surrounds itself with matrix until it is completely surrounded by matrix. Adipose tissues, I don't, what does that have to, I don't understand the reference. Cody? I think it was a joke, growing in width. Oh, oh ah, 
Ah, uh, got it. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Uh, so, and that happens, and this happens all the way around under the uh, perichondrium. So as a result of that, we get a layer of matrix that forms around the entire circumference of the bones. And so we would form what type, uh, what would we call this layer of matrix that goes around the entire circumference of the bone? Circumferential something. Someone help them out. Lamilla. Excellent. So we form a circumferential lamilla, right? Oh, I guess I forgot to put, all right, the uh, medullary cavity filled with bone marrow. And since it's an adolescent, we'll make it red bone marrow. Excellent. All right, there you go, excellent. So notice by putting a circumferential lamilla on the outer surface, we've just made the bone wider. So at its core, the process really is just that simple. Whoops. We are just, we have the original bone at its starting size, and then we add a circumferential lamilla, and then another circumferential lamella, and then another circumferential lamella, and then another circumferential lamella, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. See how incredibly easy that is? Except exactly, exactly like a tree. And so just like a tree, you can actually cut through one of your bones, count the rings, and that'll tell you how old you are, right? Is that what you can do? No. No. So that's the problem. This isn't what a, a mature long bone looks like when you cut through the diaphysis. This is the basis of this. But remember, as we mentioned, the other thing that occurs with this process is that not only do we use this appositional growth to grow the bone in width, but remember we said it also is used to form our osteons. Right? This is how we make our compact bone. So that is going to be the key for this. So no, and that's the thing. There are not a circumferential lamellae on the inside of the bone. The circumferential lamellae are on the outside. That's why we know this can't be how it works, because this is not what that mature bone looks like. I think I saw it somewhere in the book that it showed uh, both outside layer and the uh, inside layer, or it was in the lab manual. And Circumferential okay. lamella would only be on the outer surface. Okay, I'll check it out. Yep, but let's, so let's actually, it, this is the basis of the process. This is how it's going to start but we have to see what's going to occur differently and why this doesn't work. Anyone know why this doesn't work? I'll give you a hint. When you look at that bone matrix, if it was just rings like a tree, we're lacking osteons in it. And remind me again, what's in the center of the osteons? Central canal. <laughs> central canal, what's in that central canal? Blood vessels. Blood vessels. Notice this doesn't contain blood vessels. And it is the blood vessels that are actually going to disrupt this tree ring process and is gonna give us our osteons. So let's see how this works. Let me erase all of this. Nope, there's no blood vessels on this drawing. This is bone marrow that I put in the medullary cavity. All right, so what we're gonna do, and again, I'm gonna simplify this a little bit. We are gonna take a look at the edge of a long bone through cross-section. So here is our medullary cavity. And we know that medullary cavity is lined with a endosteum. 
And we know it should be in direct contact, but I'm purposely giving some space so that uh, I have some room to play with. And remind me again, what type of tissue is that endosteum? Type of tissue is an endosteum. Connective tissue, excellent. And we know it houses our mesenchymal cells. And we also know it houses some osteoclasts. Yeah, I know. Sometimes the correct answer is the simple answer. And really, I, I, I honestly, I feel that way a lot about A&P. I think what makes anatomy and physiology hard as a class is the amount of information, not necessarily the information itself. I think every individual piece of information by itself isn't that hard. It's just that when you throw it and 500 hundred other things into a bucket, it's hard to tell them all apart. And I think that's really the problem with it. And that's why studying for a class like this is very different. You have to spread the studying time out. You have to spend more time. You have to do more repetition because you don't have to learn just three big processes. You have to learn 500 little things. And it takes time to organize those 500 little things. All righty, uh, where were we? So I've got my medullary cavity, I've got my endosteum. I am going to cheat and only draw part, oops, no, I want this to be purple as well, part of my periosteum because I need the playroom down here. So I'll remind us that this is the periosteum. And this periosteum also houses mesenchymal cells inside of it. Oh, and I shouldn't have used red for all of those. Shucks, so let's fix that. Let's use blue. Mesenchymal, mesenchymal. Mesenchymal, because remember the other thing that is housed in the periosteum are the periosteal uh, blood vessels. So there are those small blood vessels that we talked about that are housed here in the periosteum as well. And let's put one right here in that periosteum that I haven't bothered uh, to draw. So we know the periosteum is here. I'll cheat and draw it and then remove it. So we know the periosteum is out, of the, out the, over the surface. We know that there are the mesenchymal cells there. We're just gonna have to visualize it uh, because we're gonna pretend that it's not there because I don't have to keep moving it uh, as we do this. Although I guess I can do that with this kind of a drawing. So heck, let's go ahead and do that. Do, 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 do. Perfect. All right. So just as we know, as we've talked about before, our periosteum houses mesenchymal cells. And as we know, they divide and they produce our osteogenic cells. And those divide to produce osteoblasts and our osteoblasts make matrix, surround themselves with matrix. And mature into osteocytes. Again, 
we've talked about this numerous, numerous, numerous times. So there's no new information there, but we know that's exactly what's gonna happen. We know that this mesenchymal cell is going to form an osteoblast. That osteoblast is gonna surround itself with matrix. And so we grow a little bit of matrix around that cell and it's now here inside of its lacuna. And as we've talked about, this occurs next to it and next to that and next to that and next to that and next to that, right? And basically as that occurs, we get our circumferential lamella. That flat layer of matrix on the outside of our bone and we've grown in width. But there are these periosteal blood vessels that are here as well. So let me scoot this back a little bit because it keeps moving as uh, this keeps growing there. Oops, no, no, just want to move it. So the same thing happens again. We add yet another circumferential lamella on the outer surface. However, what's going to happen is that these osteoblasts respect the boundaries of the blood vessel. And so as they respect the boundaries of the blood vessel, they leave space around the blood vessel. And then another circumferential lamella will form, respecting the boundaries of the blood vessel. And another layer of circumferential lamella will form. And as that does that, what starts to happen is we get these formation of what we call the periosteal ridges. So these periosteal ridges start to form around the blood vessel, respecting the space of the blood vessel. However, as it gets further and further away from that blood vessel, the ridges start expanding out more and more until ultimately the ridges fuse together. One second, I'm going to view two. You're in my way. So what will happen is that the periosteal ridges fuse together. Now, let's think about this. As we know, the periosteum is still present on the surface of these periosteal ridges. But if you think about it, that periosteum is also lining this space that is forming around that blood vessel. And so notice what happens when this ridge fuses together, it basically pinches off this piece of periosteum around the blood vessel. So a small portion of the periosteum is trapped in the space around the blood vessel. Of course, now it's no longer on the outer surface of the bone. So now, because it's surrounded by bone, it becomes an endosteum. But it's still an endosteum. It is still housing mesenchymal cells. And those mesenchymal cells can still divide to make new osteoblasts. And as they divide to make new osteoblasts, those osteoblasts that are going to form are going to surround themselves with matrix. And suddenly, I'm going to build a layer of matrix that wraps around this blood vessel. 
what kind of layer of matrix did I make here? Interstitial or melee? Close. Osteoblast form in the new endosteum. Form a circular layer around a blood vessel. And guess what? It's still not done. It can then produce a second layer and a third layer. And in this case, it's not circumferential. It's not interstitial. And notice that we're producing these inset circles all around a blood vessel. What did I just draw? An osteon. An osteon. Yeah. So notice it's making concentric. So it starts to form concentric uh, lamellae around the blood vessel until it forms an osteon with the blood vessel in the central canal. So now I have an osteon and notice this tissue next to it, filling the space between it and the other osteon that formed over here would then become our interstitial lamella. An osteon is a structure of the bone connective tissue, typically made of hundreds of cells. Again, I've done a very simplistic illustration. Let's take a look at a better one from your textbook because it does a nice job of showing this. Notice here, very nicely, we see how this works. Notice we've got some periosteal blood vessels, right? Oh, pardon me, the, the uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, periosteal blood vessels that are here, the periosteum, which is growing. And notice those immature cells are dividing and making layers of matrix but the layers of matrix are respecting the blood vessels. So we start to get the formation of these periosteal ridges. Notice as those ridges expand, they surround the blood vessel entirely. Notice they also surrounded the connecting blood vessel. So notice here, they're actually forming that perforating canal that connects the two central canals. But in this case, we've got the pinching off of it, those periosteal ridges fuse. We now have a tunnel around our blood vessel that contains now an end osteum housing immature cells. And those endosteums housing the immature cells continue to grow forward until they formed an osteon. And notice periosteal ridges are growing around the next one, surrounding it, and it's going to form another osteon. And so in this process, notice we're adding new layers on the outside of our bone, making it wider. But because of the disruption of the blood vessels, we incorporate those blood vessels and we also form our osteons. And that is both how we grow the bone in width and how we form our osteons, how we make our compact bone. Questions on that? No, I think it's just thinking it all in. Yep. Understand. It. Yep. This is how we make our compact bone. Notice, if you think about it, way back when we were talking about um, endochondrial ossification, we talked about how that bone collar formed, and then that bone collar became compact bone. Remember when we talked about intramembranous ossification, we made the spongy bone, and then the periosteum formed on top. 
And once that periosteum formed on top, we formed our compact bone cortex on top of that. So it is this arrangement of the periosteum and the blood vessels that allows us to produce our compact bone. Was it, um, was it the compact bone where we looked at the osteum independently that gave us that stretchability because um, it has, I don't remember what, what was special about it, but because of the way it forms, um, we can take twisting on bones and stuff without so, breaking. So I see what you're saying. No, well, remember this layer of matrix has collagen fibers in them. And those you know, the collagen fibers in each one of these lamellae is going to have a different orientation to it so that it resists that twisting and that shearing forces, yes. So, but notice we're not seeing the collagen fibers, we're just seeing the matrix that is being made here. Yeah, you're not gonna see the collagen fibers in it in real life, That's we saw that on the model. All right. Wait, unlike um, uh, FSEO plate growth, um, can this one occur like any part of any like um, day in your life, basically? Great question. There obviously you still have a periosteum on all of your bones. As we'll see, that periosteum is going to be vitally important for healing the bone when it gets damaged. Right. However, your bones don't typically continue to grow in width for your entire life. So eventually they do ultimately reach their uh, adult size and then basically stay at that size and shape, right? And of course, how do we tell these cells in the periosteum to stop growing so actively and just maintain the tissue instead of keep adding more? The osteo osteoclasts? Well, but we need to, how do we tell the periosteum to make fewer osteoblasts or make more osteoclasts? How will we tell it to make those kind of changes? Hormones. Uh, hormones, exactly. Chemical signals, hormones, exactly. So it's our hormone levels that will stabilize and change that will lead to the, the decrease in our growth and width. Oh, but um, for like older people that have osteoporosis or whatever, you're able to strengthen your bones any part of your life, right? To an extent. Right, it depends on how many mesenchymal cells you have, how active the division of those can be, your hormone levels, the metabolism of the cells. So again, often people who have problems with osteoporosis have one or more of those issues. It's either malnutrition or it's a lack of cells or a lack of the metabolism of the cells or any of the types of things as well. It's one of the reasons, why, and, and again, this isn't just bone, probably the best example of this you see with cartilage right? Because cartilage is one of those things that has a much slower metabolism. So a lot of times when you're watching TV, you hear, uh, you hear commercials for things that have, uh, you know, like chondroitin and things along those lines that have um, um, uh, chondroitin and other types of matrix materials for cartilage that people can take as a supplement. Right. And if you take this chondroitin supplement, then you're going to be able to build big, strong uh, uh, cartilage and replace the cartilage that you have in your knees. And for some people, yes, having more of those resources is uh, enough to get more of it to build. But, you know, you can drink a whole gallon of that stuff. If you don't have active chondrocytes, they can't replace the cartilage. And it's the same way here. You have to have the resources, but you also have to have the workers. Right. If you're going to build a wall, you have to obviously have bricks. Without bricks, you can't build a wall. But you also have to have the workers that are willing and able to put it together. And so you have to have all those things together. And if you don't have all those things together, then that leads to homeostatic imbalances like osteoporosis. Uh, Ariana, I'd be careful with your description. You've got the right idea, but I'm not sure you're completely comparing uh, apples to apples. So you've got the right idea. If you're gonna grow the bone in length, that occurs in the epiphyseal plate. And remember, you don't have five epiphyseal plates. You have really two, one at each end of the long bone. Uh, and if you're gonna grow in width, that occurs within the periosteum. So right there, we're comparing the locations. 
you are correct in that the epiphyseal plate has five distinct zones within the epiphyseal plate, whereas the periosteum doesn't really have you know, five specific zones. It just houses immature cells in one location, right? And then also the process of forming, uh, of growing bones in width also forms our osteons, which allows us to form compact bone, whereas growth bone in, growth in length primarily produces spongy bone. And then it is converted into compact bone from the outside. So make sure you're comparing uh, similar characteristics when you're talking about it that way. Yulia, yes, you had a question? Yeah, so do all of our bones have um, compact bone, at least in the surrounding, like the outer tissue to make yes. it strong? Or do we have some bones that don't have compact in them? Remember, compact bone makes up about 80% of your skeleton, including all of the superficial bone. So when you look at a skeleton, all you see is the compact bone. All the spongy bone is on the inside. Okay. Which makes sense because compact bone forms in the periosteum, which is on the outside. So every bone has periosteum on the outside. So every bone has compact bone on the outside. Okay. For some reason, I was thinking that some bones like get lost when we dig up skeletons and it's possibly because they don't have enough compact bone on them. Well, okay, so I wouldn't say that they get lost, but you have the right idea. Some bones have thicker compact bone than others, and the ones that have thicker compact bone are gonna be more sturdy than the ones that don't. And again, if we were in the classroom, you would see this. As you hold the bones in your hand, there are many bones where you can actually see the spongy bone on the inside because the compact bone on the outside has been damaged. But if you're digging up bones in the backyard, they've been decomposing, right? They were damaged in some form, something along those lines. So I mean, yes, you might see spongy bone by looking at it, but not because that's the way it normally was, but because that's the way it is because of damage or decomposition. But yeah, every bone has compact bone on the outer surface, but yes, different thicknesses. The compact bone in your femur is much, much different from the compact bone in your ethmoid bone, for instance. All right, great questions. Any others? Uh, I don't know the chapter numbers, but we are gonna be covering uh, bone tissue, bones and joints. So I think those are, you guys are always asking me about the chapters. I don't know what chapters are what. Um, Yes, yeah, six is bones and skeletal tissue, yes. Seven is skeleton, yes. Eight is joints, yes. Nine is muscle and muscle tissue, that's the next exam. So yes, uh, six, seven, and eight. Bone stuff. And joints count as bone stuff. All righty. Any other questions? All right, excellent. Now, the lab, the pre-lab for nine is due after the exam. That's going to be due, uh, and actually, no, not, not no, uh, unit, uh, so there you go. Lab nine, the, the, the lab manual uh, units and the chapters in the textbook do not correspond. So you are correct. In the lab, we're in units seven, eight, and nine. In the textbook, we're on six, seven, and eight. Yep, so the, the, the numbers don't correspond. All right, let's go ahead and take our first break. We have now made bones and we have now grown bones. So our next uh, goal is gonna to be to maintain bones. And as we'll see, there are gonna be three ways that we're going to do that. But let's do that after the break. It is 1.15 right now. So let's go ahead and take our first break. We will restart at 1.30 and at 1.30, I will restart the recording. Uh, before we break, I got... Yes, I know they got our hopes up as well with that whole hybrid thing. Uh, no, we don't count. Um, the, uh, we will not be, the 
sciences are not considered uh, classes that can be safely held in small groups uh, because uh, we are in the classroom working together in small groups. It isn't something that can stop that can be safe. Now, as they said, if things change, uh, then we may be able to open it up. Uh, science is an important subject, but it's primarily things that I know that their wording of it is hybrid, uh, makes it seem like they're gonna be able to do a lot more, but really they're not. The only thing that they're, they are, any class that cannot be held um, online, and these are things like primarily like EMT classes or things along those lines uh, that can be done there. Uh, auto mechanic stuff, things along those lines that can't be online. Uh, and then things that are held outside primarily. So like, again, auto mechanic stuff because they're in the garage or like agriculture classes or things along those lines. Well, again, Sac State is a different, uh, is a different uh, uh, district than we have. And this is the decision that was made uh, by our district. So uh, the big difference between Sac State is Sac State's got more money for more testing of the students and things along those lines at the community college, uh, especially since we're, although Sac is mostly a commuter school as well, uh, but uh, being primarily a, a community college, commuter school, the district doesn't have the funds for the testing of students and, and things along those lines. Uh, so my understanding is that, uh, and again, things could change, but we don't fall under the category of the classes that are, are eligible for hybrid as of right now. So yeah, unfortunately, as you know, you know, this is spread close contact for more than 15 minutes of the time in an enclosed space. And that would be exactly what we would be doing in a science class. No, summer, uh, summer, this hybrid that they're talking about is they're talking about for the fall. Summer is completely online. So that's already been decided. They're just talking solely about fall. Uh, things are trending in the right direction, so they're hopeful that there'll be some changes. Uh, but as of right now, my understanding is that uh, there isn't any science classes that are going to be going hybrid as far as I'm aware. So we just learned about the continuation of um, born bones forming. And then now when you come back from uh, the break, we're going to talk about maintaining the bones now. Yeah, so that's exactly. We have grown bone. We've made bones. Right. And we did that two ways. We then grew the bones two ways, length and width. And now, as we mentioned, even though we're all mature adults and our bones aren't getting, we've already made our bones. We have all the bones we're ever gonna have. Uh, even though we've got them to their full height and width, we still need to maintain them and bone is still a very dynamic tissue. So yes, our goal when we come back from the break will be to talk about the uh, maintaining of the bone and the three uh, main characteristics that are necessary for that. All right. Excellent. Now we talked a little bit longer, so we talked for three more minutes. So let's go ahead and make it three more minutes. So we'll come back at 1.33, get your full 15 minute break. And at 1.33, we will restart at that time. All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. Time to dive back in. So as I mentioned, we have talked about how to make bones and we have talked about how to grow bones. However, bone homeostasis isn't done at that point. Uh, the process of remodeling the bones is a constant ongoing process where old bone tissue is constantly being broken down and reabsorbed and being replaced by new bone tissue. So basically remodeling really involves two main processes. One of those processes is bone resorption. Bone resorption is where we break down the bone matrix. And of course, it is the osteoclasts that do that. And when we break down that matrix, that matrix is released into the interstitial fluid. And of course, once it's in the interstitial fluid, where are those materials from the bone matrix going to go? The calcium, the phosphate, the carbonate, the magnesium, when they're broken down and released into the interstitial fluid, into, where the, does, blood. into the blood, absolutely. Excellent, into the bloodstream. You have absolutely the right idea. 
The second process is bone deposition. <clears throat> bone deposition is the process by which we make new matrix. Obviously, new matrix is made by the osteoblasts. And of course, this uses uh, the resources in the interstitial fluid. And of course, where does the interstitial fluid get those resources, like the calcium, like the magnesium, like the carbonates? I don't remember if those are new answers or the previous one, but they're right from the blood. So notice as we have, and again, we'll take calcium as the best example. As bone is resorbed, we are taking the calcium out of the matrix and releasing it into the blood. When we're depositing that calcium into the bone, we are taking the calcium out of the blood and depositing it into the bone. So as we talked about, one of the keys to this remodeling process is that remodeling influences both bone density and calcium levels in the blood. So those two factors go hand in hand. Now, if our goal is to maintain homeostasis and we have these two processes going on, bone resorption is going on and bone deposition is going down. Uh, we are breaking down bone matrix and making new bone matrix. And if we're doing both of these processes at the same time and we wanna maintain homeostasis, what do we want the relative uh, rate of these two processes to be? Equal. Equal, exactly. We wanna be breaking down matrix at the same rate that we're building matrix. And if we can do that, then we can maintain homeostasis. So our goal of maintaining homeostasis is to maintain that consistent rate of resorption and deposition and have them be equal. However, are they going to be equal to each other for our entire life? No. No, absolutely, right? As an adolescent, Uh, what of these two processes are, are, are these two processes of resorption and deposition occurring at the same rate? No, more bone deposition, I think. Well, do you think that they're making more bone or they're breaking down more bone? Making more bone. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, resorption, oops. Uh, it, it, deposition is greater than resorption. Conversely, as we were talking about with grandmother, right, when you're more elderly, what happens to the relative rates of resorption? Resorption uh, over deposition. There you go. Again, some of that is like we talked about the decrease in hormone levels and things along those lines, but there are other factors that influence it as well. And so absolutely, uh, this does change during the course of our life. So as, as mature adults, most of us have that rate of homeostasis being equal, but as we age, then we start to shift uh, more deposition, making more bone matrix as we're uh, younger, reaching that state of homeostasis and then getting that rate where there's more resorption than deposition taking place. So like we talked about, even if grandma's drinking a whole cow's worth of milk and taking her estrogen and doing all those other things, if the rate at which her osteoclasts are breaking down bone matrix is faster than the rate that her osteo, uh, osteoblasts can make bone matrix, she's going to continue to lose bone density. Yes. So can we do activities in our youth that permanently influence our bone like for the rest of our lives? Well, and you've kind of hit it on the head, right? We 
not just as uh, as adults or as children, but even an elderly, right? This isn't just happening in a vacuum. There are factors and primarily three main factors that are able to maintain our bone homeostasis to help us to try to keep big, strong, healthy bones. And what are those three factors that are gonna help us to influence it? I think we've mentioned them all at some point during this, but let's put them all together. What are the three factors that can influence and modify homeostasis? Nutrition, absolutely, right? What we take in, what exercise. else? Exercise and? Well, it's not so much genetics, but because we can't change our genetics, but what we can change are our hormones. Absolutely, hormones, nutrition, and exercise. Those are the three main factors that are going to affect and influence how we maintain homeostasis. Let's start easy. Exercise. Activity is vital for bone maintenance, right? But when I say exercise and maintaining big, strong, uh, heavy, heavy bones, what kind of activities am I talking about? Heavy lifting. Kind of well, I like heavy lifting. Excellent. Absolutely. One of the keys to it is that we want to have some type of weight bearing. I like that. I like that weight bearing exercise. Is the key to it when we're talking about weight bearing exercise, where we're putting stress on the bones, right? If you uh, injure your back or injure a leg and you're laid up, or if you happen to be an astronaut who's hanging out at the International Space Station for a couple of months, that lack of weight bearing exercise, that lack of stress on the bones can cause you to lose as much as one third of your bone mass in a few weeks, all right? So it is vitally important that, yeah, absolutely, it's dynamic and bone adapts to stress. There you go, yeah, carry your toddler around, absolutely. But make sure you switch hands, right? When you put stress on that bone, the bone uh, basically responds in two main ways. Well, knees are something different. We'll talk about that in a second. But let's, we're talking about bone first. We're not talking about joints. We'll get to the joints in a minute, but let's talk about bones. Bones responds to stress in two ways. The first thing is that it thickens, it makes more bone matrix. But the other thing it does is it aligns the osteons within the bone along the, uh, along the lines of that stress. One of the classic places where you see this is in tennis players. Tennis players have a dominant hand. Well, we'll like I said, we'll talk about joints, we'll talk about synovial fluid in a bit. Let's talk about this first. Dominant hand. Yes, there are some two-handed swings that they will make, but the serves, many, ser many of the shots are single-armed, right? And when they do that, typically their dominant hand, when you look at and take x-rays of the bones in their dominant arm versus their non-dominant arm, the bones in their dominant arm are typically thicker and heavier and have more aligned osteons from that stress. This is both a good thing, but also can be an issue as well. If, for instance, you have a soft tissue injury like to a muscle, or if you have an injury to your knee or, or some other joint, that can change you to shift your balance, to shift your weight, to shift your gait. And as you change your gait, you are now suddenly putting stress on the bones at a different orientation than they were before and can actually cause that bone to weaken. You sometimes see this in sports. Someone has a ligament injury or something like that that they are recovering from and they come back for two weeks and suddenly they break a bone. Uh, and the reason may be because of the weakening of the bone because they changed their gait or they changed their alliance or they weren't able to put as much weight on the bone as before and it weakened as a result of that. Another way we see this is in the muscle attachments. Right now, Yuli, is your hand up? Uh, did I miss you putting your hand up or is that from before? That must be from before, I'm sorry. I can put it down. I just, I wasn't sure if that was there from before. So I know we haven't gotten to our legs yet, but hopefully most of you know where your kneecap is. 
go reach down and grab your kneecap. Right below your kneecap, you should feel a bump on your tibia. That bump on your tibia is called the tibial tuberosity. That tibial tuberosity is the attachment point for your quadricep muscles. And for everybody, it's fairly prominent. But if you happen to be a soccer player or a distance runner or something along those lines, well, again, you probably, your, your, your ligaments have tightened as you've gotten older, your muscles have gotten larger. Yeah, it also depends on the angle of your knee as well. But we're not talking about the kneecap. We're talking about below the kneecap on your tibia. So again, here, we'll cheat. So kneecap down from there right here is your tibial tuberosity. That is that bump. That bump is an attachment point. And if you are a, if you are a, um, don't do that either. Um, if you are a um, runner, distance runner, bicyclist, things along those lines, uh, soccer player, the stress of that muscle pulling on it um, makes that attachment larger. Remember last, uh, last week we were talking about the occipital condyle, that bump on the back of the head. That enlargement is the pull from the pulling of the ligamentum nocha and the trapezius on the back of the head. So I made the joke, like if you fell asleep in class a lot of times and that ligament had to pull your head up, then that bump gets bigger. So that bump tells you how many times you've, uh, you've fallen asleep in class. You guys are getting distracted by the whole knee thing. Let's focus on the bones and what we're doing there. So stress on the bone makes it stronger, makes it thicker, makes it bigger, aligns it. All right, the question becomes why? The reason for this is that electrical activity stimulates the osteoblasts. When we put stress on the bone, that stress on the bone produces a small electrical current. So compressing the bone produces a small electrical current. Now we're in COVID and you're, not, you're, you're supposed to be limited in your shopping. So otherwise I would make you do this by uh, Thursday's class, but I'll give you some time. So if it takes a little longer to get, your, uh, to get your Amazon order or something along those lines, but this is something you can actually experience for yourself. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you grab a hammer and hit a bone or something like that to have it do that. But how many people here have ever chewed on a wintergreen lifesaver in the dark? Anyone ever done that before? Boy Scout or Girl Scout camp? Sleepover house at somebody's house? Madison said yes. Excellent, anybody else besides Madison ever done that before? Yeah, there you go, Max has got it too. Absolutely. Right. The reason you do it in the dark, go into a bathroom. If you've never done this before, then like I said, the next opportunity you have, buy some wintergreen lifesavers, take one and put it in your mouth and go stand in the bathroom, close the door. The advantage of that is you have a mirror and it's completely dark. And when you bite on that, crunch it really quickly, you're compressing the crystals in it. And when you compress the crystals in that, it produces small little sparks. Just you were deprived as a child, right? That's the whole reason to go to a sleepaway camp. Sleepaway camp, you get to learn things like this, right? Making lanyards and uh, seeing sparks from uh, this. <laughs> so uh, definitely try that. And But that's exactly what happens. When you put stress on the bone, that stress on the bone produces a small electrical current and that electrical current, right, stimulates the osteoblasts. This is one of those things we take advantage of. As we've mentioned, most, as we mentioned, bones are well vascularized. But really the correct statement is most bones are well vascularized. Not every bone is equally vascularized. A great example is the kneecap you guys keep talking about, that patella we were talking about as an example because it's in a tendon, isn't well vascularized. Some of the bones in your wrist uh, aren't well vascularized. So when you break those bones, uh, probably one, the, the first time that I ever heard about this happening is way back in ancient times, there was a football player by the name of Jerry Rice, uh, greatest wide receiver of all time. And uh, one year he broke his kneecap 
and uh, playing the game. And one of the things they did is they took uh, an electrical stimulus and basically put these wires in his kneecap to stimulate it with an electrical current. And that electrical current stimulated the osteoblasts and helped it to heal more rapidly. Yeah, there you go, exactly, excellent. Yeah, kneecaps the sesamoid bone, exactly. So it's in the tendon and because it's in the tendon, it's not as well vascularized. And so, you know, so sometimes they'll put an electrical stimulus into the wrist or the ankle bones, uh, the kneecap, places like that to stimulate it, to try to get it to heal more rapidly when it is broken. All right. So that is the importance of exercise. Putting that weight bearing stress on your bone is something that helps you to maintain the bone, absolutely. So walking, jogging, right, weight bearing exercises, things along those lines, uh, uh, bicycling, anything that, again, depends on the bones you're talking about. But yes, stress on the bones helps to maintain the bones, makes them stronger, makes them thicker, and aligns the osteons. And now we know why. Well, and yes, so that's the problem. We are talking just now about bones. Someone mentioned about knees and things like that. Joints obviously handle stress differently. Swimming is probably a classic example. Swimming does, so there you go. Swimming, think about swimming. Swimming is great for the joints because it's low impact. So if you're, you know, so you, you uh, it's low impact, uh, re uh, reduced uh, resistance and things along those lines. So it's less impactful on the joints. However, is swimming gonna help you to produce big, strong bones? No, because you're not putting any stress on the bones when you're in the water, right? So it's great for joints, but it's not good for bone density, right? Uh, weightlifting obviously would be, uh, cycling is probably better. I'm not sure what you mean by bone tightness. Uh, exercising, especially stretching, helps to uh, maintain the ligaments, maintain the joints. Uh, and, and the muscles. Uh, and yeah, that's one of the big problems that they have with uh, with astronauts. Astronauts have very special types of like Stairmasters and all these other types of things with all these straps to help to put resistance on them so that they can help to try to maintain their bone density, absolutely. Shin splints have to do with uh, the enlargement of the muscle. It's a muscle issue. It doesn't have anything to do with the bone. And we'll talk about shin splints uh, in, in specifically when we get to the muscular system. Obviously, yeah, with the gyms closed and it is more challenging. So like uh, Yulia does, just uh, pick up your kid. And if you don't have any kid, just uh, find random kids and pick them up. It's a good way to, uh, and then you get to run away from their parents or from the police. And so again, all good stress, weight-bearing exercise. All right. <laughs> it's been there, exactly. All right. So that is exercise. Let's talk about another easy one. Next easy one is nutrition. But this one's not quite as easy. There are definitely the obvious stuff. We need a daily intake of dietary calcium and phosphate, magnesium, fluoride, iron, manganese, etc. And all of these are needed to produce bone matrix. So these are part of the um, of the materials that need to be ingested on a daily basis to be able to make the matrix. This is this kind of stuff that the matrix is made out of. And so obviously those are things that need to be ingested. But it's more than just the matrix itself. Vitamin D is a very important uh, 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 vitamin to have. Vitamin D, notice it says intake or synthesis. Obviously intake, we can ingest it, but how do we synthesize vitamin D again? Does anybody remember? Wasn't it from the sunlight in the skin? Exactly, in the skin we have certain cholesterol a special cholesterol in the skin that when exposed to UV radiation from the sun gets converted into vitamin D. That vitamin D then gets activated, whoops, wrong button. It 
into a hormone. And that hormone is called calcitriol. Not that kind of cholesterol, Yulia. Um, so great question. So obviously you need to, so again, think of it this way. If you, you, you have a certain amount of things like calcium and magnesium and things like that, that you need in your body. If you take a lot of magnesium in today, do you necessarily have to take it in tomorrow? No, not necessarily. But these are things that your body can store some of. But primarily, these are things that are either used or they're flushed out of the system by like the urinary system. So these are things that constantly have to be replenished. So again, are your bones going to fall apart if you go a day without drinking a glass of milk? No, but there's also lots of other things that have calcium in them. Broccoli has calcium in them. Cheese has calcium in them. All sorts of other things have calcium in them as well. So there's lots of ways to get these things in your diet. But absolutely, it is, it is better to get have these things readily available to maintain the health of your bones. Maintain that bone matrix. Now, as we talked about this activated calcitriol, because we talked about this originally uh, when it was in the integumentary system, this calcitriol targets the digestive system. And it tells the digestive system to absorb calcium. You can drink a whole cow's worth of milk but remember, as we talked about, our digestive system is outside of the body. So we need to absorb it across the membrane of our stomach, across the membrane of our small intestine to get that calcium into our body. And calcitriol tells your digestive system to do that. If you don't have calcitriol, then you're not able to absorb a lot of calcium from the food and the drink that you ingest. Yes, Laura. Um, so I think on the review, there was a question about um, osteoporosis and insufficient um, calcium intake. So in this case, because our body can't, is it not making the hormone fossil trio? Or is that why we would be um, having to take the um, like calcium to kind of maintain the calcium in our body or is that something different? Well, so so uh, let me answer your question this way. I don't remember the question in the review, but uh, mm -hmm. what you said, if you're not ingesting calcium in your diet, then obviously it doesn't matter how much calcitriol you have, there's no calcium in your digestive system to absorb. Okay. But if you drink a large glass of milk, if you don't have that active hormone calcitriol, you're not going to be able to absorb most of that calcium into your body. So your diet's going to have a lot of calcium in it, but you're not able to absorb it into your body so that you can't get the calcium into your body. Then that's the problem. Now, the good news is, like I said, it only takes about 15 minutes of sunlight a day to convert that, cal that, uh, that, uh, that cholesterol into vitamin D. The problem is we're all quarantined at home and nobody goes outside anymore. But luckily for us, they put vitamin D in things like milk. It's almost impossible to buy milk that isn't vitamin D fortified. So that when you drink that glass of milk, you're getting the vitamin D, which allows you to activate that vitamin D. It doesn't really help you absorb that glass of milk, but it helps you with the next mm -hmm. glass of milk you're going to drink. So we can get vitamin D from our diet as well. So that's why we have to either intake it or make it. Yeah, we're going to try this in your front yard. I'm sorry, yes? I have a quick question regarding the sunlight. Like, does it matter if you're up early in the morning or like at sunset? Do you have to be out during the middle of the day to get that vitamin D made? It's all about UV radiation. At sunrise and sunset, the uh, oblique angle of the sun means you're getting less direct sunlight. And so you're getting, yes, UV radiation, right? So typically you tan slower in the morning or at night than you do during the middle of the day. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, you would need a little bit more at sunrise or sunset, but you know that's the golden hour when you need to take all your pretty pictures anyway. So as long as you're out there in the golden hour taking your, you know, your pictures for Instagram, then you'll be fine. All right. Yeah, I have teenage girls. I know about the golden hour. All right. Excellent. So, 
Let's talk about another important uh, substance that needs to be ingested, right? Back in ancient times, and this time I mean ancient times, right? Uh, Great Britain ruled the world. And the reason Great Britain was able to rule the world is they had the best uh, navy. There you go, exactly. Julia sees where this is going, the best navy. In fact, at one point their navy was so strong and they controlled uh, countries all over the, the surface of the globe and that they used to say that the sun never sets on the British Empire because no matter where you were on the globe, England controlled something there. And yet their navy was almost completely destroyed by scurvy. Right? This was a condition where the gums would bleed and the teeth would fall out and the bones would become brittle and break and the skin would tear. And why did they get scurvy or how, more importantly, how did they get rid of that scurvy? What was the miracle cure? Limes, exactly. Limes, vitamin C. Vitamin pineapple C. Pineapple soap? I'm sorry? Do pineapple soap? Do they have vitamin C? It's a great question. I assume it's, a, I think it's a citrus fruit. Isn't that considered a citrus fruit? I don't actually know. That's a great question. Oh, because I know they used it to clean their uh, boats, boats or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, lime is primarily what they use. But the point is vitamin C, which I'm guessing is in pineapple, um, allows us to make collagen. Remember, we make bone by taking those crystals, taking the calcium, the phosphate, and the magnesium, and depositing it onto that collagen fiber. We don't have the collagen fiber, there's nothing to deposit those resources on and we can't make the matrix. Now, of course, as we know, collagen is the most common protein in the body and it's important for the skin and things like that as well. So not only did the bones become brittle uh, because you couldn't maintain the bones, but like I said, their skin tore, their gums bleed, their teeth fell out, all of that stuff as well. So obviously we need to be able to make collagen we talked about the scurvy. And there's lots of others, what we call micronutrients. Micronutrients are things that we just need the tiniest bit of. Uh, some examples of those are things like vitamin A, vitamin B12, vitamin K. Uh, these play a very important role in things like producing bone marrow or producing red blood cells, right? So these are things having to do not so much about the bone themselves, but maintaining the bone marrow which as we talked about is where we make all the blood cells. And obviously making blood cells is one of the important functions of our skeletal system. So if we're gonna maintain a healthy body, we need to maintain not just a healthy matrix to the bone, but also a healthy marrow to the bone as well. So as you can see, it's not just about calcium. It really is about getting all of the nutrients that are necessary to maintain that. All right. <laughs> Cod liver oil <laughs> uh, for the omegas. Yeah. Scurvy is the disease where that, that the, the lack of vitamin C. So again, you got to remember that um, these, uh, 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 the, the, I can't think of the people who live on the ships, the, uh, the seamen were basically uh, on their boats for long periods of time. Sailors, there you go. Sailors was the term I was looking for. Sailors were on the boats for a long period of time and uh, their diet was very restricted. And so as they uh, were not getting vitamin C in their, um, in their diet, like I said, their bones would break easily, their skin would tear, their gums would bleed, their teeth would fall out. That condition, that disorder is known as scurvy. Alrighty. So the last thing, and actually let's do it this way. Before we do it here, let's do it here. The last factor we need to talk about are hormones. And remember, when we're talking about that hormonal regulation of the bone, we can't forget that these hormones are also going to play a huge role in the regulation of calcium levels in our blood. 
these two things go hand in hand. Now, a couple of these we have already talked about. We already know how the sex hormones, oops, don't want these to be capitalized anymore. And again, what were the two classes of the sex hormones again? Estrogen and androgen. Estrogens and androgens, excellent. Those estrogens and androgens, oops, excellent, uh, are the sex hormones, right? And what did they do? What was their target? They targeted the osteocytes. Or... Excellent. And what did they do to the osteocytes? They um, targeted the osteocytes for growth. Yeah. So again, Ariel's got it. They stimulated. Oops, oh, he's full stimulate. How do they exactly stimulate it? Is it because it's a catalyst or something? They increase the metabolism of it. Basically, they cause them to metabolize more so that they take more nutrients and deposit more of it onto the collagen. So they stimulate the osteocytes, right? That is the target. That is what their direct effect is. And then, of course, because of that, basically what this does is this increases... Uh, deposition or resorption? Deposition. Deposition, excellent. And so since we're increasing deposition, do the bone, does the bone matrix get uh, thicker or thinner? More bone matrix or less bone matrix? More. More. More bone matrix, right? And as a result of that, we're getting less calcium in the blood. Because if we're making more bone matrix, we need to be grabbing that uh, calcium from somewhere. And obviously, as we said, it comes from the interstitial fluid from the blood. So there's more bone matrix and less calcium in the blood, right? Really no new information here. We've just kind of synthesized everything that we have talked about for that. We've also talked about another hormone. Oh, and we should probably say it here as well, because uh, we're summarizing all of this hormonal stuff. Does estrogen and androgens affect the osteocytes equally? No. No, which no. one had the greater effect? Estrogen. Estrogen. Estrogen has a greater effect on osteocytes. Excellent. Or actually, it should be blast. Sorry. Deposition. There we go, excellent. All right, the other hormone we just finished talked about was calcitriol. Calcitriol, remember as we talked about, is the active form of vitamin D. What did we say it targeted again? Our digestive system. Digestive system, excellent. And what was the effect of that? To absorb calcium or... Uh, yeah, absorb no, absolutely right. It increases absorption of calcium. Excellent, from the digestive system. Now, of course, what is the direct influence of that going to be? Uh, increased blood calcium levels. Yep. Increased calcium in the blood. Absolutely. That's going to increase calcium in the blood. However, if we have more calcium in the blood, then there's also more calcium for the bones, right? So this, this is going to help the blood and the bones in this way, because we're getting the calcium in the body. 
right? Notice this doesn't really affect resorption and deposition, not directly. This directly just increases calcium in the blood, but that does mean that there's more calcium for the bones. So again, just synthesizing information, really nothing new there. However, what we need to talk about now are two new hormones. The first hormone is called calcitonin. Calcitonin is made by the gland, thyroid gland. And it has three targets. The first target is the osteoclasts. The second target is the um, kidneys. And the third target is actually calcitriol production. So let's see the effects. For our osteoclast, what it actually does is it actually inhibits. Oops, oops I spell inhibits right. The osteoclasts. What's the effect of that going to be? More bone uh, being broken down. Well, remember the osteoclast, the osteoclast break down bone or do they build the bone? It's the opposite. It'll break it down. Break I mean, it down. Yeah. There you go, exactly. Perfect. We are <laughs> gonna break down less bone. Oops. So if you think about it, what this does is this decreases uh, resorption. And as an effect of that, are we gonna have more bone matrix or less bone matrix? More. More bone matrix. And less calcium in the blood. Kidneys. It tells the kidneys, uh, the kidneys job filters blood, right? That's what the kidneys do. And they do a ton of it. You produce 200 liters of filtrate in your kidneys in a 24 hour period of time. Now, does that mean you produce 200 liters of urine in a 24 hour period of time? No. no, of course not. Absolutely not. If we were doing that, then we'd all be sitting in the bathroom while we were giving this lecture. And more importantly, do you have 200 liters of extra material in your body you could get rid of in a 24 hour period of time? No. No, of course not. So over 99% of that stuff is reabsorbed. So most of the stuff that comes out in filtrate, we bring back in and instead we only produce about one to two liters in a 24 hour period of time. So one to two liters of urine in a 24 hour period of time. So our kidneys filter the blood. Well, what calcitonin tells the kidneys to do is it says, hey, kidneys, when you're making that 200 liters of filtrate, don't bring back as much calcium. So it decreases the resorption or the reabsorption, let's say it that way, of calcium. And so because of this, more calcium leaves the body in the urine. And if more calcium is leaving the body in the urine, what does that, while that doesn't directly affect uh, the bones, what effect does that have on our blood levels? More calcium in the blood or less calcium in the blood? Less, less. <laughs> And lastly, it suppresses the production of calcitriol. So if we have less calcitriol, 
are we going to absorb more calcium from our digestive system or less calcium from our digestive system? Less? Less. And of course, once again, that means less calcium in the blood. Notice the overall effect of calcitonin is calcitonin lowers blood calcium levels. And because if we look at that effect on the osteoclast, it decreases bone matrix. So if you have that donut and diet Coke for breakfast and you're not getting, or no, actually this is the opposite. Uh, if, if you have a big, huge glass of milk for breakfast, you have plenty of calcium readily available and we're able to uh, release that excess calcium. Isn't it increasing bone metrics? Because, um... Oh, you're right, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you, I, you're right, I said that wrong and increases bone matrix. So lowers calcium levels, increases bone matrix, puts the calcium into the bone, puts the calcium out of the body, or doesn't let the calcium come in at all. All right, questions on that? Which is great when you have that big glass of milk or that bowl of cereal with milk and you're getting lots of calcium. Yes, Julia. No question. So why do we sometimes make, I, for some reason I connected it with calcium, an excess amount of calcium. Why do we sometimes make like calcium deposits in our organs? I, I didn't realize we pee it out as well, like to get rid of extras. For some reason I thought too much calcium makes you have like stones. So you are correct in that. Um, eh. So, um, everybody has calcium crystals that are produced in their uh, kidneys. When you're producing urine, some of the crystals of calcium, some of the calcium crystallizes and forms calcium crystals. So every single person here in this class makes calcium crystals when, in their urine uh, when they, and they release them. However, in some individuals, and why this occurs in some individuals and not others, what can happen is that those calcium crystals will clump into a larger structure that is called a, a kidney stone. So a kidney stone is basically a large clump of calcium crystals. Why it occurs in some people and others is not fully understood. There appears to be some genetic component to that. So if kidney stones runs in your family, you're more likely to have it, but not necessarily guaranteed. So we know it's not 100% genetic, but there are other things that can be triggered as well. Uh, eating chocolate, eating broccoli, stress. There are other factors that can, uh, 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 carbonated beverages. Um, those are things that can make it more likely that calcium, uh, st that kidney stones will form. Now, because kidney stones are formed by calcium crystals, if you, are predisposed to form calcium uh, kidney stones, then decreasing your calcium input somewhat, you don't wanna drop it to zero, but decreasing your calcium input can help to mediate that and to lessen the, the likelihood of them coming. But, it, but you can't stop taking calcium entirely and it's not unnormal to have calcium. So it's not that you have too much, it's not from drinking too much milk that it's gonna cause, but, but if you do get kidney stones, drinking a little bit less milk can be something that can be helpful. Great question. Any others? All right, so again, calcitonin is great when you have that nice big glass of milk for breakfast, lowers blood calcium levels, increases bone matrix, but like I said, what happens if you have a donut and a Diet Coke for breakfast? Well, luckily we have one more hormone and that one more hormone is the parathyroid hormone. Oops. Oops, uh-oh, hold on. Um. No, 
it's a great question. So someone asked me a private question because they were worried that I would offend a somebody. But uh, the question was, uh, is, it, is it a concern for people who, for instance, have a more of a vegan or a vegetarian diet if uh, they can necessarily get the calcium that they need? And yes, they're, like I said, uh, actually uh, broccoli has a large amount of calcium in it. There's plenty of uh, uh, dark uh, leafy vegetables that have uh, 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 enough calcium in them. Uh, tofu, soy, things like that can have calcium in them. So there's lots of other things. Yes, you have to be more careful. If you're restricting your diet, you have to be more careful to make sure you're getting the wide range of uh, the micronutrients as well as macronutrients that you need. But, but yes, with, uh, with care, it is easily possible to, uh, to have a successful vegetarian or even vegan diet and uh, still be able to get all the nutrients that you need. What I will tell you and what you don't want to necessarily do is take vitamins, right? Uh, vitamins, um, there are two problems with vitamins, three problems with vitamins. The first problem with vitamins is that most of them in pill form uh, don't, yeah, like daily multivitamins, exactly. Um, the first uh, important thing about them is that um, many of them, because they're in pill form, uh, and because people typically don't take them with enough water, typically aren't exactly, well, not so much urine, but it's, they don't uh, dissolve completely. And because they don't dissolve completely, a lot of it never gets absorbed into your body. So many of it leaves with the feces. Yes, the second problem is that you get a large spike of it into your body. And as we just finished hearing, your kidney is constantly filtering the blood. So when you get a massive spike of it into your body at one time, even if you're able to absorb it, like from taking drops or something like that, uh, much of it is going to be filtered out by the kidney, exactly. And so there's lost in the kidneys that way. Uh, and then the third problem is that um, they don't do anything. Right. If you are deficient in something like iron or something along those lines, then iron supplements can be very, very vital. But in the history of the time that, and it's a billion dollar industry, in the history of time that, uh, that people have been taking vitamins. Well, we'll talk about pre prenatal vitamins in a second. That's something different. But multivitamins, in the history of multivitamins being taken, there has been no study that has shown any effect of taking them. Taking a multivitamin uh, does literally nothing. There's never been a study that shows that it has any effect on anything. Now, like I said, we're not talking about taking iron supplements if you're anemic. We're not talking about taking prenatal vitamins to make sure you're getting your folic acid and things along those lines when you're pregnant. Those types of vitamins absolutely positively are vital. But daily vitamins don't really do anything. They don't harm you. So if it makes you feel better to do it, then by all means do it. But it's really not doing anything. All right. Parathyroid hormone. With a name like parathyroid hormone, not surprisingly, it is made by the parathyroid gland. And not surprisingly, it has three targets. Yeah, no, there's nothing better than those Flintstone chewables. Those were awesome. I know most of you aren't old enough to know to get that reference, but I don't care. I guess, like I've said many times, I tell the jokes from me. I, uh, I don't care if whether you get them or not. All right, excellent. Plus, it was always fun to say you're eating, Betty. All right, there are three targets for the parathyroid hormone, and not surprisingly, those three, uh, those three targets are the same as calcitonin. Uh, it is the osteoclasts, it is the kidneys, and it is, uh, nope, I don't, uh, and uh, I have tenure, I don't care, um, and it is calcitriol production. <laughs> now, see, you got to remember, I'm a dad. You know, I've got, I've got two teenage kids <laughs> who roll their eyes constantly. I uh, no, and I definitely didn't know. There's no secret about chemistry or Brady. Shame on all of you. You're losing participation points for that. Um, Who's Brady? <laughs> Tom Brady. Oh, okay. Greatest cheater in football history. All right. Back on topic. Not surprisingly, the three main targets of parathyroid hormone are the same three targets as calcitonin, 
right? I got, however, their effects are very different. Parathyroid, uh, its effect is to cause uh, increase in activity. It excites the osteoclast. That means we break down more bone matrix. And if we break down more uh, bone matrix, we are increasing reabsorption. which means we have less bone matrix, but we get more calcium in the blood. Am I gonna run out of space here? Let me cheat a little bit. Uh oh, now I've really screwed up, hold on. All right, our second uh, target is going to be the kidneys. Only, which of course, as we know, filters the blood. However, in this case, uh, parathyroid hormone increases the reabsorption of calcium. So this one tells the kidneys, all right, that calcium you were putting out in the filtrate, bring it on back. We need it, all right? This means that less calcium leaves the body and we have more calcium in the blood. And lastly, parathyroid hormone stimulates calcitriol production. That means we get more calcium absorbed from the digestive system. And of course, that means it raises more calcium in the blood. So again, notice all of these factors together they work together to raise calcium levels in the blood. And unfortunately, the other effect downside of that is that it decreases bone matrix, weakening the bones. Yeah, it is, but such is life. Compare what? So there you go. Notice while we're talking about these hormones, well, yeah, obviously we're talking about the hormones. So definitely, I, I shouldn't, at this point, you should be getting sophisticated enough where I don't have to tell you that this is definitely a possible essay question. Absolutely. All right. But Yes, yeah, CA is calcium, absolutely. Right, same way sodium is NA, same way potassium is K for some reason. Yeah, for a second I thought it was uh, calcitrol. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> no, no, calcium, more calcium, CA, calcium. Technically it should be CA++, right? Because it's has a double positive, uh, it's an ionized with a double positive. Is that really where the K comes from, calcium? Is that calcium, which they call potassium? Yes. Oh, there you go. See? Excellent. Then why do we call it potassium? Why don't we call it calcium? See? Chemists are stupid. <laughs> All right. Excellent. So the point being, as we look at this, we see this importance of these hormones. But notice, while these importance affect the bones, they're equally, if not more important, for regulating calcium levels. And we see that when we look at a pretty picture like this.
Yeah, resorption, remember, is what we're doing to the bones. Resorption is when we are breaking down the bone matrix and releasing it into the, the releasing the calcium into the blood. Reabsorption is when uh, the kidneys, remember, are expressing out those 200 liters of material and then we're bringing it back into the body. So reabsorption is bringing it back into the body. Whereas our digestive system, it's just absorption because we're bringing it from outside of the body back in. I mean, not back in, but bringing from outside the body into the body. So yes, so that's the difference. So in digestion, we can never take things out of the body. We only put things into the body. Well, not necessarily. When you produce saliva, you're secreting that saliva out of your body into your mouth and then in your stomach and your small intestine, some of those materials are going to be reabsorbed. So yes. Okay, but we won't like use digestive tract to take, let's say, you know, toxins out of the body. That's something specifically yeah. like the, okay. That's the kidney, yeah, exactly. Or the liver, which filters it out as well. All right, notice here, we see this example of what happens when calcium levels drop. Like I said, when calcium levels drop, we need to bring the calcium levels back up. So our parathyroid hormone tells the kidneys to reabsorb, hold on to calcium ions. It stimulates the osteoclasts so that uh, we break down matrix releasing calcium into the blood and it stimulates the production of parathyroid hormone, uh, pardon me, the production of calcitriol uh, so that we absorb more calcium. Conversely, if calcium levels in the blood are too high, calcitonin tells the kidneys to let it go. Calcitonin stops the breakdown of bones so that we're not releasing calcium into the blood. And calcium stops the production of calcitriol so that we stop absorbing it. Yeah, we can go back to the whiteboard in just a minute, but hold on. I want to make one more important point. If you haven't figured it out by this point in this class, I'm not a huge numbers guy. Right? There are going to be numbers that we run into in this class that are going to be important and that you are going to have to memorize. But a lot of numbers are just things that you can look up. Right, Like, for instance, what the normal range of calcium is. If you wanted to look that up on the interwebs, you could easily pick that out. And again, I'm not saying that that information doesn't have its uses. I mean, look at the range here. The low level is 8.5 milligrams per deciliter up to 11 gram, uh, milligrams per deciliter. Right? That kind of information is useful, for instance, if you're trying to, I don't know, woo a woman at a bar, right? Walk up to a woman at a bar, sit down next to her and look her in the eye and say, hey, did you know that the average, the, the normal level of calcium in your body is between eight and a half and 11 milligrams per deciliter? And she just swoons when you say that, right? Works every time, exactly. Uh, so again, it's useful for things like that, but it isn't necessarily something that we need to memorize. They're going to be numbers we need to memorize, but the point I want you to see is how narrow that range is. Eight and a half to 11 is a tiny range, right? When we think of the normal range of, uh, of your temperatures, your, you know, of your body or pH or things along those lines, this is an incredibly restrictive range. And it goes back to what I've said many, many times. Calcium makes cells do wonky things. Keeping control of calcium allows you to contract your muscles, to produce action potentials, to communicate with your nervous system, to release substances from glands. Calcium is vital for so many major functions of the body. It's why when it comes down to a choice between bone density and calcium, calcium wins every time. Because calcium and keeping that tight restrictive amount of calcium in your blood is vital for the function of your body. All right. So uh, someone wanted to see that. All right. Questions on any of that? Now we're on time. Yeah, it's a little late, but we'll do okay. All right. That is everything I wanted to cover for lecture for today. So what we'll do is we'll take one more break and then we will come back and we'll work on our group presentations, trying to get the rest of the bones that we need. It is uh, 2.34, 2.35 right now. So let's come back at 2.50 and at 2.50,
uh, we'll uh, have our groups start with their presentations. All right. Questions on any of that? Uh, oh, yeah, I can put you guys, I'll put you guys in your breakout groups if you'd like to do that. Absolutely. So I'll put you in your breakout groups and then so that you guys can work on that uh, and preparing those presentations. And we'll come back in 250 and do that. All right. Any other questions? All right, I will stop sharing. I will stop recording.